Um, the movie uh, is entitled Two Distant Strangers. And that title is taken from a two-pack um, rap song from, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. When was Tupac shot dead? Anyway, it's, it's taken from one of his uh, rap songs. But... Um, a review was written, not a, 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 view, a review necessarily, but it was written about by Michelle Norris in a column for the Washington Post the other day. And she starts out like this. What if the best day of your life was also the worst? The day you meet the love of your life, and then a few hours later, you meet a cop who guns you down. And what if you experience that day over and over again? Kisses and hugs, French toast and giggles, and then boom, you're dead with a cop standing over your body. Right away, I, I, I think you're drawing a, a comparison, as I did, with Groundhog Day. Uh, that film that came out in the early 90s where the grumpy weatherman uh, relives February the 2nd again and again until he gets it right. Remember that? But that's not this. However, that... You know, you're dead over and over again, and then you wake up and, and you're back in bed where you started with your girlfriend. That's the premise of this Oscar-nominated Netflix short. And the film was written by actor and comedian Trevon Free. And the movie centers around a guy named Carter James. He's a smart, witty, black urban hipster, but he's repeatedly reliving the same day as he wakes up in bliss, I mean, he just spent the night with his gorgeous girlfriend, then reluctantly, he leaves his new sweetheart to head home to feed his dog. Or at least, you know, he tries to head home. And in the course of this 32-minute film, he keeps meeting the same menacing white cop who always assumes he must be hiding something in his backpack and shoots him dead. Again and again. Now, like I mentioned, this might have a distant echo of Groundhog Day to it. But this is more like Groundhog Day meets uh, Hunger Games. This is not a comedy. Um, our hero, Carter James, the hero in this movie, wakes up every day knowing after the first day, that he's stuck in a death loop. So he changes his route to go home from his new girlfriend's apartment to his own, changes his route, changes his clothes. He tries to be friendly uh, to the cop because he's going to meet the same cop every day. He tries to show that he's respectable. It doesn't matter. Boom. He's shot dead every single time. Now, what this movie captures, as Michelle Norris points out, is a, well, first of all, it's a very potent work of uh, fiction that captures the, 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 the reality of American life right now, which is this never-ending list of unarmed black people who wind up with these brutal and often deadly encounters with, for the most part, white cops. And like the hero in the movie, or like the main character, James, we, all of us, are stuck in, in, in this cycle of deja vu. I mean, ha haven't you felt that way? I'm, I'm talking for a moment here to my white brothers and sisters, um, my black cousins, well, you may be brothers and sisters too, who knows? Um, they've been living with this for a long time. We haven't. White people haven't. And all of a sudden, when, when it happens, seemingly, it doesn't happen every day that we're aware of, but it starts to feel like it. I mean, when this happened in, in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, 
as has been pointed out so many times, 10 or 12 miles from where the trial of uh, Derek Chauvin is going on. It's it just like, what, what? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, what? It, it, it just keeps happening. We haven't even reached the end of Derek Chauvin's murder trial for this, uh, this gruesome killing of George Floyd. And now we're processing another dose of police madness, police brutality, as uh, Michelle Norris puts it. So, Mr. Free, what's his, what's his name? Um, Trayvon Free, the uh, actor and comedian who, who wrote this. He wrote the film shortly after George Floyd was killed, you know, last, last year. And Free is a former college uh, football, a basketball player who has also written for The Daily Show and F Full Frontal with Samantha, uh, Samantha Bee. He was raised in Compton, California. Um, he now lives, uh, uh, Trayvon Free now lives in uh, Beverly Hills. And he himself, he says, has been pulled over by police throughout Southern California while he was driving or walking or holding car keys on the street. He's been stopped. This is something, uh, again, I, I, we whites don't, un, we, we, <sighs> calm down, Mike. White folk don't understand this because it doesn't happen to us. Like I mentioned the other day, I've been stopped before, for usually for speeding or, um, well, it's usually for speeding. And like I said, I haven't, I haven't gotten a, a, a ticket in forever which is kind of puzzling to me, but that's a whole different story. But when I'm approached by a cop, it's always because I have broken a law, a traffic law, and I know it. I've never had a cop walk up to me, and when they say, Mr. Malloy, or they don't say that, they say, Mr. Driver's License, say, do you know why I stopped you? I've never said, no, I don't, I have no idea. I've always said, um, I think I was speeding you know, that little uh, submissive sound that you can put in your voice when you're talking to a cop, right? But I've never been stopped while walking or simply holding car keys on the street. But I'm white. So that's why. And that's something that we just don't think about. I mean, we can't. There, there's no way we can think about, well, I, 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 don't get, I didn't get stopped by the cops today because I'm white. I mean, we don't think about that, white people. I don't know how black folk think about the same thing, but I would imagine there's a good chance that when a young black man goes home at night after he's been wherever he's been, he may have a brief thought or a fleeting thought, wow, I didn't get stopped today. You see what I'm talking about? I mean, I don't know. But I just know that we whites are not harassed the way black folk are, especially young black men. But anyway, um, Trevon Free, who, who wrote the movie and stars in it, he says, quote, I wanted people to feel what I was feeling. And it got to the point where words no longer got the job done. End quote. So he made a movie. And in the movie, he has these repeated encounters with a white character in the movie's Officer Merck. And he's a real menacing looking guy. I mean, just Jesus, God. Um, there's something about Southern white s sheriffs that to me is menacing, even though I've never been, well, except when I was 17, I've never been harassed by one. But you, you can always tell, uh, if you spend any time in the South, a Southern white sheriff. But Officer Merck in this movie, I mean, he looks like just a, a standard cop. I mean, uh, there's nothing uh, unusual about him at all. He's just a cop. Until you get a close-up of his face. And then the word menacing applies, right? But... Officer Merck conjures up that hideous buffet of, po of police violence that's going on in America right now. 
whether it is shooting a woman in her bed or, or a woman committing suicide after being dragged out of her car and arrested for, for what? Uh, or, or, or shooting a kid walking down the street or, or a 10-year-old boy in a park because he has a toy gun in his hand. That's what they mean by a buffet of police violence that's occurring in the country right now. So anyway... The main character's repeated encounter as he goes through these, he wakes up after uh, dreaming every day. It seems like every day. He has this encounter with Officer Merck. On one day, a cop pulls him to the ground and kills him. The next day, he's chased and killed. And then he's mistaken for someone else on the street and killed. And then he's making breakfast when NYPD officers burst into the wrong apartment, his girlfriend's apartment, and kills him. Now, I I have to tell you, um, as Michelle Norris points out in her review, let me quote what she said. Quote, this brief film is an immersive experience. You root for Carter to get home to his dog. You look the cop in the eye. You pray one day there just might be a different outcome. And every time, you lose. And that was the part of of this movie when I watched it last night, this film, that I'm I'm telling you, it it had me riveted to to, to the chair I was sitting in. It had me tensed up. And I kept hoping, okay, this time, this time, he'll make it home. Everything will be okay. And Michelle Norris points this out. She says, midnight basketball and community policing won't lift us out of this hell. The kid and the cop are like the scorpion and the frog. Two creatures whose shared survival in crossing a stream depends on the scorpion repressing his instinct to attack. But the scorpion can't do it. He stings the frog knowing it will doom both of them because, as that fable tells you, quote, it's just the nature of the beast. Well, I had to sting you. It's who I am. So now they both die. So... Michelle points out the obvious, too. She says, we'll never escape the infinite loop of death and trauma until we accept the fact that American policing was born out of a system that was established to protect the the rules of white supremacy and to control the movements and aspirations of black and brown communities that might threaten that status quo. Now, that isn't necessarily the mandate of police work today, but it is policing in this country's origin story. It just is. And and as Michelle points out, until we admit and remove the vestiges of that history, we're doomed to live inside this tragic spin cycle, which is the point this short film is trying to make, obviously. Now, Trayvon Free says he wrote this film because he wants people to understand the constant fear of being surveilled, judged, bullied, and then deified after death with, with, with the hashtag eulogy that we see all over social media. Hashtag George Floyd. Say her name. Say his name. Who the fuck wants that? Don't you think that the dead people would rather be alive than have their name take the form of a eulogy as a hashtag on social media? Which is the point that Trayvon Free is trying to make. And as Michelle writes... But to make real progress, police officers must also do what the scorpion could not. They must change 
the nature of the beast. And who's the beast? 